Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this video, we're going to look at some of the sources of errors that you can get when performing numerical computations. And we'll look at some of the basic methods that you can use for analyzing how errors may behave. So let's talk about error, which is a fundamental idea that we'll see throughout this course. Suppose we're trying to take some real-world problem and calculate something from it. Then, to begin with, we're going to have to approximate that real-world problem and build a mathematical model. And that will certainly introduce some errors that we can't control. We'll have to make various modeling assumptions to go from the real world to the mathematical model. And we might have, for example, uncertainty in parameters or initial conditions. But once we have our mathematical model and we actually try to compute with it, then there'll be additional numerical sources of error. The first is truncation or discretization error. And that's where we have to approximate continuous processes with discrete things that we can actually calculate. For example, we might approximate a continuous derivative with a finite difference, or we might truncate an infinite series and only use a finite number of terms. The second source of error that we might encounter there is rounding error. And so computers don't calculate arithmetic to infinite precision. They make use of finite precision arithmetic, where only a certain significance of every number is retained. And so whenever we add numbers or do other types of arithmetic operations, we'll incur a very small error in those calculations that may build up over time. So it's crucial for us to understand and control the error that we might encounter in a calculation. Otherwise, we might end up with completely incorrect results. This is really a major part of scientific computing about error analysis. And this has really become more and more crucial as scientific computing has developed. When we have modern computers that can process billions or trillions of operations, there's a real risk that those errors can build up over, over time. And most people are really familiar with rounding error, but it actually turns out that discretization error is often the most important in practice. So to illustrate the difference between discretization error and rounding error, let's look at calculating the derivative of a scalar function f of x. We'll look at calculating the finite difference approximation to the mathematical derivative f prime of x. And we'll do this by introducing a small value h and calculating the function f at two points x and x plus h. From here, we can numerically approximate the derivative. Let's call this f diff of x by looking at the slope of the function between those two points. And this works out to be equal to f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. So from here, let's look at the Taylor series approximation with remainder. So here, we can evaluate that f of x plus h is equal to f of x plus h f prime of x plus f double prime of theta h squared over 2, where theta is some value between x and x plus h. Now, let's substitute that Taylor series expression into our numerical derivative. We find that our numerical derivative, f diff, is equal to the true mathematical derivative, f prime, but with a small correction, equal to f double prime of theta h over 2. Now, let's suppose that we know that the second derivative of our function is bounded by some value capital M over the interval from x to x plus h. Then from there, we're able to bound the difference between the mathematical derivative and our finite difference approximation. It's going to be equal to mh divided by 2. So the problem is that we can't actually evaluate f diff exactly. When we do this on our computer hardware, we're actually going to get some finite precision approximation that we're going to call f tilde diff. So we'll look in more detail exactly how rounding error works soon, but it turns out that the most significant contribution to rounding error will basically be in the numerator of our expression for f diff, and we'll get some error that's less than or equal to epsilon times the magnitude of f of x. And we'll look at this in more detail soon too, 
but that value of epsilon is typically around 10 to the minus 16 on modern computer hardware. So now, if we look at the difference between our exact precision f diff and our finite precision f tilde diff, that will be less than or equal to epsilon times the magnitude of f divided by h. So we can now use the triangle inequality to evaluate the total error that we might get in this calculation. If we look at the difference between the mathematical derivative f prime and our finite precision approximation f tilde diff, we can break this up into two components, one of which is coming from our discretization error bound and one that's coming from our rounding error bound. And if we put this together, we find that our total error is bounded by mh divided by 2 plus epsilon times the magnitude of f divided by h. And so typically, because epsilon is so small, around 10 to the minus 16 on modern computer hardware, we would expect that the discretization error would probably dominate. However, if h gets very small, then because it has this 1 over h factor, we might find then that the rounding error might dominate. So to illustrate the two different sources of error, let's look at a numerical example. Let's look at the function f of x is equal to e to the 5x and evaluate its derivative at x equal 1. So here, we know that the analytical derivative is just given by f prime of 1 is equal to 5. And so we can compare our numerically computed solution to this analytical value. So in the plot shown, we're looking at the total error as a function of h using logarithmic axes. So let's first look at the right part of this plot. So here we're in a regime where h is large and the truncation error or discretization error dominates. So as h gets smaller, the total error will go down. But once we reach h equal 10 to the minus 8, we hit a, a minimum point, and after that point, as h gets smaller still, the error starts to go up. And for that regime, we've actually now hit the point where rounding error will dominate. So it's a useful little exercise to actually use calculus on our error bound and determine why this minimum an error is reached around this point of 10 to the minus 8. Note that in this finite difference example, the error actually grows as h tends to 0. And this is actually a rather nasty situation, and it occurs because we have that h in the denominator of our error bound. A more common example that we'll see in this course is that errors can actually plateau as an algorithm progresses. And we'll see some examples of this in Unit 1 on data fitting. So for example, our error might look like something shown in this semi-log plot, where we're showing the total error as a function of some number of iterations of some algorithm n. And as n increases, the error might go down, but then it will hit the point where it will plateau around this precision of epsilon. So let's revisit the error bound that we derived. We look to the difference between the analytical derivative and the numerically computed one. And this is a bound on the absolute error, which is defined as the difference between the true value and the approximated value. It's often more interesting to look at the relative error, where we take the absolute error and we scale it by the true value. Relative error is more interesting because it takes the scaling of the problem into account. However, there are several difficulties with relative error. First, we might not actually know the true value, and instead we might have to use some surrogate for it. For example, a value that's computed using a more accurate method. Another problem with relative error is if the true value is very close to zero, in which case we might have some numerical uh, difficulties. So now, let's just look again at our error plot, but instead of looking at the original total absolute error, let's instead look at the relative error. And here, we essentially get the same plot, but the only thing that's changed here is that the vertical scale is now different. 
So we've now shown several plots of error as a function of discretization parameter. And in general, plots like these are very important in scientific computing because they allow us to confirm that our numerical method is performing as expected. And to display convergence data in a clear way, it's often important to choose the correct axes for our, our plots. So most often we'll encounter algebraic convergence, where error decreases like alpha h to the beta for some alpha and beta. So suppose we have this situation and our error y is equal to alpha h to the beta. Now if we take the logarithm of this equation, we end up with that log y is equal to log alpha plus beta log h. So now, if we plotted on a log-log scale with y on the vertical axis and h on the horizontal axis, then we would end up with a straight line with slope beta. Hence, a good way to deduce that we have algebraic convergence is to use a log-log plot and look for a straight line. Sometimes we'll encounter exponential convergence, where error will decay like alpha e to the minus beta n as n tends to infinity. So suppose we have this situation and our error y is equal to alpha e to the minus beta n, and again we take the logarithm. So in this case we end up with the log y is equal to log alpha minus beta n. And so here a more appropriate axis choice would be semi-log axes. We plot n on our horizontal axis and we then plot our error y using a logarithmic scale on the vertical axis. And in this case, if we have exponential convergence, then we'd expect to see a straight line.